We have these bright lights on, it's pretty hard to see you. It is my great pleasure to be with the most of you for the second time today. It has been a day of remembrance, a day of recall, a day of history lessons, and a pleasant reunion for many of us. The 1960 West Virginia presidential primary will always remain a part of American history and a real legend. I was still in college, I'm glad to say, in 1960 when that presidential race was going on. And like each and every one of you, I remember it well. I remember the importance of the West Virginia decision during the primary and how it managed to send a signal to the nations on the matter of religious tolerance. And I remember that West Virginia also sent a message that uh, just a little bit of money and uh, thousands of close friends always does a lot in any election. But, but perhaps most of all, I remember that 1960 ushered in a new era of hope, of promise, and even of humor. Even to this day, those young people who cut their teeth in the 1960s political campaign still employ that same spirit. And in many ways, Sergeant Shriver is a symbol of all of that. As head of the Peace Corps, as the ambassador to France, and even as vice presidential candidate, Sergeant Shriver personified grace under pressure and goodwill to all. As John Kennedy taught us, humor can carry you a long way in politics. And I remember that after George McGovern had parted company with his first running mate and had struggled to find another, Sergeant Shriver proudly told the press, and this is a quote, embarrassed to be George McGovern's seventh choice for vice president, not me. After all, he said, we Democrats may be a little short of money, but we're not short of talent. Pity, he said, Mr. Nixon, his first choice and only choice was Spiro Agnew. <laughs> Perhaps the moral of this tale is that uh, you can still lose an election, yet come out way well ahead in the history books and in the esteem of your countrymen. I had the opportunity while the panel discussion was going on to speak a few moments to Sergeant Shriver. And he now, as many of you know, is serving as the chairman and just, uh, has just taken that job and, and was long the president of the Special Olympics. He told me some facts about the Special Olympics that I was unaware of. And it's a great tribute to he and his wife and the whole Kennedy family. Uh, the Special Olympics today uh, has about a million two hundred and fifty people participate in it in each and every year. It's in over 90 countries and annually it raises over a hundred million dollars. Quite an accomplishment for Sergeant Shriver. It is indeed my pleasure and my great honor to welcome back one of our real favorite people, Sergeant Shriver. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Well, Governor Caperton, Governor Hewlett Smith, my old and good friends from over in Huntington, seated here in the front row, and ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a real pleasure for me uh, to be back in West Virginia. I don't remember ever having an unhappy experience or an unhappy moment in this state. I was here for quite a while, too long enough to have experienced some unhappy moments. But from the first night I was here, uh, when I was taken to an old-fashioned minstrel show, uh, the fellows here from Huntington will remember, I was taken to a, a minstrel show in Wayne County, wasn't it? 
uh, from that very first experience until today, I've only known the greatest of hospitality from the people of West Virginia and the greatest of sympathy and understanding. This is a wonderful state, I think. It's a great example of America at its best. And the title of this symposium is by itself, I think, a dramatic statement of a unique historical fact. You chose well when you decided to celebrate the primary that made a president. The only primary that ever made a president. A primary which occurred right in this state in our lifetime. We were part of that historic event. Many of us never experienced a more important political event because, let us recall, that primary launched, launched a president who even today, almost 30 years after his death, is, along with FDR, the most revered and admired and beloved political figure in this century. More than Eisenhower or Churchill, more than Woodrow Wilson or Teddy Roosevelt, more than Conrad Adenauer or Georges Clemenceau? The answer is yes. More revered, remembered more nostalgically than any political figure in this century, in or outside the United States. 15 years ago in central Russia, beyond the Ural Mountains, my wife and I were staying overnight in a hotel 2,500 miles at least from any other Americans. We were 5,000 miles at least from any place that Kennedy had ever visited. I went for an early morning walk with a Russian friend, returning to the hotel at about 8 a.m. for breakfast. I saw three or four hundred people standing in a plaza in the plaza in front of that hotel, standing behind a rope drawn across the plaza to prevent them from blocking the entrance to the hotel. I asked my Russian friend, why are all these people standing there looking up at that hotel? Uh, he didn't know, so he asked a policeman. And then he said to me, these people are standing here because they heard a rumor that someone related to President Kennedy is staying in the hotel. When he explained that I was a brother-in-law of Kennedy, and that Kennedy's sister, my wife Eunice, was actually a guest in that hotel, the crowd moved up toward the barrier, toward me, and they stretched out their arms to shake hands with me, to touch the clothes I was wearing, to look into my face, because I was related to a man they had never seen, whose language they could not speak, whose government was locked in a cold war with their own government. Kennedy had reached them. Somehow or other, he had touched their hearts. He represented something they wanted. He filled some need, represented some hope or ideal that they cherished. Though Kennedy had already been dead 10 or more years, he was not forgotten, not even in the Central Asiatic part of the Soviet Union. Nor has he, in my judgment, been forgotten here in West Virginia. The place and the people whose votes 30 years ago catapulted Kennedy into the national, onto the national and world stage. What did we learn then? What did the West Virginia primary teach us? What difference does it make now? Are we gathered here like real veterans just to relive a famous battle or a victorious campaign? Are we indulging really in reveries of the past, telling old war stories? Or does the West Virginia primary reveal something or perhaps many things important for today and possibly for the future? I think we did learn one or two, maybe three, profound truths here in West Virginia. Truths relevant for today. Truths which we can see even now, 
changing the face of the political and moral landscape of the world in Central Europe, in Africa, in the Middle East. Maybe soon, here in our own country once again, these truths will raise our own sights and hearts. First of all, the West Virginia primary proved that ordinary people are much more perceptive, perceptive about human nature, more capable of evaluating character, and more responsive and open-hearted in responding to honest, truth-telling talk than many of the experts realize. Kennedy never underestimated the intelligence of the voters. He never talked down to them. He never played to their prejudices or to their emotions. He never manipulated them or sought to arouse their fears or the less noble qualities of their spirit. He trusted their brains. He appealed to their better nature. He had confidence in their humanity. Secondly, Kennedy never ducked an issue. He never tried to avoid a difficult problem. That's why he explained his religious beliefs and convictions, and at the same time his commitment to our American Constitution and separation of church and state, without equivocation or double talk, without any trace of dissimulation or artifice. Many times in this state, I saw people listening to Kennedy from inside their houses, unwilling to appear near Kennedy in public, but anxious to hear his voice and see his figure, peering out from the windows of their houses by opening up the blind which was drawn, drown, which was drawn down and they would peek around the corner and look at Kennedy through the side of the window. I saw that many times in many places in this state. For they thought, I believe, that maybe this time there was a politician they could trust. He did not speak in long, complicated sentences. He did not use big words or flowery oratorical language. He spoke man to man, woman to woman, so to speak, down to earth, about jobs, about poverty, about religious prejudice, about his plans for America. He never talked down to anybody, anywhere. Third, we learned in the West Virginia primary that Kennedy was willing to stake his political future on the voters in a state far distant in every way from his own state. Why? Because, I think, he had confidence in their intelligence, in their honesty, and in their humanity. He believed they would vote for him if he told them the truth, even if he did talk with a Yankee accent. Moreover, he had courage. He was willing to stake his political future on West Virginia. His confidence in West Virginians was not misplaced. His honesty with them was exactly the same honesty and clarity and directness that reached across the world and touched even those Russians in Central Asia. What difference does this West Virginia primary make even now, today, not in 1960, but today? I believe this primary tells us that the leaders of America today should follow Kennedy's example in West Virginia. They should be telling the Russians and the peoples of all the Eastern Bloc countries and the peoples in South Africa in simple, straightforward, honest language, what we believe, what we are willing to do with them if they are ready to join with us, what the problems are and will be, what the difficulties are and will be, where we stand, what we expect of them, and what we can do and what we cannot do. Yesterday, a political poll taken in seven countries all over Europe, revealed this astonishing fact. When asked whom they would prefer if given a chance to vote for a president of the United States of Europe, twice as many Europeans voted for Gorbachev 
as compared to his nearest rival. He had twice as many votes as Mitterrand, the president of France. Mitterrand was second. He had more than twice as many votes as Margaret Thatcher of Great Britain. He had more than twice as many votes as Helmut Kohl of Germany, who was fourth, or Andreotti of Italy, who was fifth, and so on. Why does Gorbachev, a Marxist who can't speak English or French or German, outpoll the leaders of France, English, England, and Germany? I'm not sure I know the full answer to that. But I think it's because he talks language that ordinary men and women can understand. He holds out hopes for peace and unity that they desire. They think they see him pulling down the walls. And I refer specifically to the Berlin Wall, which they think would never have come down unless he had say, said, stand back. They see him, not us, reducing military strength and armaments. They see him trying to reorganize life for everyone, in his own country and elsewhere. Even if he's doing it badly, in many respects, they think he's trying. They think he's trying to create a better chance and a new hope for peace in Europe and prosperity for his own people, but for others too. Now, even if Gorbachev is a liar, even if he's just an unreconstructed communist not fit to be trusted, he's showing, I think, that talking sense to people, being honest and visionary for Europe as Kennedy was in West Virginia, is the most effective way to speak and act politically anywhere and everywhere. I'll never forget my days in West Virginia for the marvelous human beings I met here. Andy Hubris, right down here in the front row, and his wife, Pat, I hope she's here somewhere, Bob Emerson and Roberta, Judge Ferguson and his son, C.W., Frank Lombardo and Mike Postera, who are dead now, Bob Myers, David Fox, down in the front row, Bob McDonald, who's dead now, Matt Reese, Bill Hogg down in Williamson. I'll never forget the Pritchard Hotel in Huntington, where we got free hotel rooms for our campaign. I'll never forget Cabell County or Wayne County or Lincoln County or Mingo County. I still treasure in my living room a handsome cigarette box that Jack Kennedy gave me after the victorious West Virginia campaign. He inscribed the box with these words. It reads, to Sarge Shriver, wanted, better alive in Mingo County. <laughs> he gave me too much credit for his victories south of the Canaba. But better alive, a big part of me will always be here in West Virginia. It was in West Virginia that I learned, with Kennedy as my teacher, that an honest man talking sense can win an election as long as he truly respects the people, the specific human beings to whom he is addressing his words. For my part, I pray that our country will be blessed soon, once again, with a courageous and intelligent leader who can, like Kennedy, win in West Virginia and launch a new and better era in our nation's history. West Virginia sent Kennedy on his way to glory. Even though history, it is said, never repeats itself, let us hope and pray that another, that another American will have the wisdom to come to West Virginia, tell his story to the solid, battle-proven people of this state, and from here go on to lead our country and the world. We surely need such a leader today. Thank you very much for giving me this chance to be back with all of you. I hope you sense that I'm extraordinarily happy to be here. I respect the people of this state. In fact, I love everything about West Virginia. Thank you very much.
Sergeant Shriver has consented to take some questions uh, from the audience. Um, we have microphones on either side, and uh, any insights or questions you have to ask them. Well, I would imagine that uh, having had this symposium going on for almost the whole day, that all the questions have been answered. All the questions have probably been answered. So uh, I will not be upset if there aren't any questions. On the other hand, uh, there may be some statements. Maybe somebody in the audience would like to say, make a statement and tell me what, what's the matter. Oh, here. Yeah. One, uh, Excuse me. What's the answer? <laughs> well, as of this very moment, I don't see that person uh, clearly, which is not to say that that person does not exist. Uh, the time may not be exactly appropriate uh, for such a person to uh, uh, announce themselves. I've had some uh, pretty high hopes for several people that uh, they would decide to take the plunge, as they used to say. But so far, uh, no specific person has even begun to indicate that he or she is ready to run against George Bush this next time. Yet, it's already only, what is it, three years to the next election. And uh, nowadays, in American politics, two or three years is almost essential uh, to mount a, a national campaign. Not just to get the campaign together, but to raise the money and get out and start to do the work. So I would hope, yeah. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I can't see you, but it's a light shines right in my eyes, but go ahead. Well, I remember you from way back. I don't have much to do now. And I would like to know if you're going to run for president in 1992. Uh, hey, James Manchin will support you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jim Manchin, how are you? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Well, I did not choose uh, Governor Smith there. I didn't actually choose this place to announce my candidacy. No. <laughs> But if there's a if there's a swelling uh, that I sense out there, a grassroots swelling. <laughs> What's that? I carry West Virginia. Well, I tell you, that's very good news. Thank you very much. Thank you for the suggestion. You're very kind. Thank you, Jim. Yes, ma'am. Myself, I was uh, worried. But then, in a sense, as a campaign worker, I was paid to be worried. Uh, I've never known a successful campaign where the people working the campaign were anything other than worried right up until the polls close. In fact, I think if you're not worried up until the polls close, you stand a pretty good chance of losing the election. And so, personally, I was not uh, convinced that Kennedy was going to win, nor was I uh, expected that his uh, majority would be anything like as decisive as it turned out to be. Andy, what do you say? Were you all absolutely certain he was going to win by that amount of uh, uh, percentage-wise? We carried Wayne County, it did not have a Catholic church, and only 20 Catholic families lived there. We won in Wayne, but we lost in Tadley County. One of three counties. And we lost, uh, we lost Lincoln County. We lost the county that started where you ran uh, the campaign out in the northern part. <laughs> Surely, it must be the Hammond's 
high school band. And so Teddy thanked the Hamlin High School band and said, we want you to come to Washington and play for my brother's inauguration. And the fellow jumped up and said, we're not from Hamlin. We're from Guyon Valley. We're not going to vote for your brother. And we don't like the idea that you don't know what the name of our band is. <laughs> Okay, they were going to have a rally for Kennedy, and uh, he had been uh, coming to Charleston, so we had to have a, a bus. And I said, Sergeant, uh, what kind of bus should I get? He said, Well, get the uh, Greyhound bus. It's a forty. So I got a great big Greyhound bus. We spent four hundred dollars on a sign saying Campbell County for Kennedy. That night we left with Dave Fox. Bob Myers, Andy Hoover, and Sarge Trout. <laughs> and we pulled out of Calvin County, we picked up one drunk in Milton. <laughs> <laughs> and we arrived with this big route <laughs> at the Charleston Civic Center with Calvin County for Ted. Did I tie in with the previous question? Why did Senator Kennedy leave the night of the election night? I mean, was he pretty sure he was going to lose the election? Well, I, can, I can't answer that question because I did not leave uh, with him. I wasn't uh, at the hotel, I think it was in Charleston, finally, that, where it was decided that he would go back to Washington. Uh, so honestly, I can't answer the question. I, I've heard it said that uh, the information given to him indicated that if he won, it would be very close. And he probably thought maybe it would be better not to be here. But I can't vouch for that, for the truth of that statement. He came back pretty quickly, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, thanks to all of you for being here. As I say, it's a great pleasure for me to be back in West Virginia. I'm sorry I'm only going to be here such a short time. But uh, the state looks wonderful. The trees look as beautiful as ever. The airport's improved. <laughs> and I imagine that Huntington even looks better. <laughs> Thank you very much.